Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about a very widely used machine learning model called the random forest. Now, I have a lot of opinions on how the random forest model is considered by the machine learning community, but I think they'll make more sense when we're finished with the content of this video. So let's start with a real world example. As always, let's say that you're the data scientist for the education department in your city, and your current goal is to build a model to figure out if a high school student will drop out before getting their degree. Now there's many features that you're going to use. So for example, you use their grades, their GPA, for example, their demographic information, their family income, but you also have some features available to you that probably aren't going to be helpful, like let's say their height, their weight, other things of that nature. So let's say you have N students, so these are sourced from a couple of different high schools in your city. And let's say that there's P features, where P is a relatively large number of features. Now let's say that your idea is, I'm gonna use a decision tree as my model. So you go ahead and build your decision tree, and I won't go into explaining how a decision tree works. I have some videos on that, which will be linked below. But in a nutshell, basically what it does is at each level, it's going to split based on which feature is giving the most information or is the most helpful currently. And then we work our way down like that. So at the next level, it's gonna pick which feature is the most helpful now, and so on and so on until we get to the leaves of the decision tree, at which point we're ready to say that yes, the student will drop out, or no, the student will not drop out. Now let's talk about some of the pros of decision trees, which is one of the reasons that people use them so much. One of the big ones is that they're scale invariant. What that means is that it doesn't matter if your features are in meters or feet or degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius, it really doesn't matter at all. It's not necessary as it is with some machine learning models in order to get all your features at the same scale. It's gonna work fine just the way it is. Another big pro is that it's robust to irrelevant features. So like I said before, we have some probably irrelevant features here. We have the height of the student, for example. So we don't need to worry about taking that out beforehand and it negatively affecting the model. Because of the way I described decision trees, if that feature is truly irrelevant, it's just never gonna get chosen to be split on, so it's not doing any harm. So you don't have to worry too much about weeding those out beforehand. And I think the biggest pro of decision trees is their interpretability. So what I mean by that is there's some machine learning models like SVMs or neural networks that there are some intuitions, but it's really difficult to explain them to someone who's never really studied statistics before. Compare that with a decision tree, you can basically just show them this output from your computer and say that I made the decision about whether the student's going to drop out or not by just following this decision path. And that's a very natural way that people think about things. Basically, it's a flowchart. Now, as good as decision trees are, there's one big con, and that's why we need to use random forests. The big con of decision trees is that they tend to overfit. And I have a video on overfitting as well, which I'm going to link below. But the basic idea of overfitting is that the decision tree takes the data that's used to train it and learns it too well. So that typically happens when the decision tree gets way too deep. Basically, it's gonna do really, really well on your training set of N students here, for example. But when you try to use this on students outside of the sample, maybe from other high schools, it's not going to generalize. It's not gonna do very well because it's learned these small patterns which actually probably are just accidental in your training set. So there are ways that we try to prevent this. For example, decision tree pruning, we try to limit the depth of the decision tree, but the fact is that decision trees are still kind of prone to this problem of overfitting. And that's where the random forest comes in. So a random forest is called a ensemble method. And if that word is unfamiliar to you, an ensemble is just a collection of things that are all working together to a common goal. So a random forest, and that's where the forest part comes from, is a collection of lots of decision trees that are working together. How many decision trees? We can choose that, that's gonna be B, but it's typically a big number, something in the hundreds or something in the thousands. And the high level idea is that we're going to build thousands of these decision trees. Each one may be overfitted itself, but if we consider them all together, the final result, the final prediction that they output will not be as prone to this overfitting problem. So let me explain that in a little more depth by talking about the first addition that random forests offer on top of decision trees, which is called bagging. So this idea of bagging is not specific to decision trees or random forests. It's really something used in general in machine learning. But let me explain it in the context of random forests. So we're gonna train B trees, again, something in the hundreds or thousands. This is the pseudocode. We're gonna say for I equals one, two, all the way to B, we're gonna do the following three steps. So the first thing we're gonna do is split our data randomly into an 80-20 split. So for example, 80%, 20%, the exact split is really up to you. This is just for example. So we're gonna take these N students and randomly take 80% of them to be our training set, 20% will be our testing set. Then we build a single decision tree on this 80% of data we're gonna be using for training, and we call that single decision tree T sub i. 
So for example, if we're in the first step, this will be T1. Then we measure the accuracy in the other 20% of data that we used for testing, and we call that A1. Then we train the next decision tree. So we're going to go to I equals 2. We're going to get a different 80-20 split. So again, this is random. And we're going to build a second decision tree called T2. Now, since we used a different training set, we're going to get a different tree, T2. Now, after we finish this process, we're going to have B decision trees. So T1 all the way to TB. And let's say a new student, X, comes along and we're trying to predict whether this student will drop out or will not drop out. So what we do is we ask each individual decision tree. So for each of these B decision trees, we basically ask if you think the student will drop out or will not drop out. And we call those decisions T1X all the way to TBX. And in order to make a final decision, we simply just take a majority vote. If you're doing a regression problem, you might take an average. It really depends on your situation. So we basically ask each of these trees what their decision is, take a majority vote, and that's going to be the decision we go with for this student. Now, this also offers kind of an added bonus of prediction uncertainty. For example, let's say that we train a thousand decision trees in our random forest. And let's say that when it comes time to ask if a given student will drop out or not drop out, let's say that the vote is 600 for and 400 against. Now, that is a very different situation from if it's 900 for and 100 against. Because in the 900-100 case, we're a lot more confident about this prediction, since there's only 10% of the trees are saying that it's going to go the other way. Versus the 600-400 case, we're still going to say that the student will drop out, because that's the majority. But we can assign a lower confidence, since the number of trees that are for and against is more close together. So before moving on to idea number two, which makes this actually a random forest, let's reiterate idea number one, bagging. The reason we do bagging is because although a single decision tree might be overfitted to the training data. When we use thousands of these trees together, although each one individually might be overfitted to its respective training set, when we use all of them, we kind of wash out that overfitting so that the final prediction we get is a lot more robust, has a lot less variance than if we used only a single decision tree. Now there's one more problem here that we need to address. It's possible that some of these features are more important for this set of end students but that doesn't generalize well to the overall high school student population in our city. Just to give a concrete example, let's say that for these N students that we sampled, family income is really, really important in making our prediction about whether they're going to drop out or not. But let's say that in general, family income is not as important as it is for those N students. So why is this a problem? Because that means that even though we're training many, many of these trees and doing a different 80-20 split each time, we're probably going to come up with family income as an important feature for most or all of our decision trees. And what that's going to lead to is our decision trees becoming highly correlated together, which means that although we are training a thousand of them, all these decision trees, if we inspect them, look kind of the same. And this is a situation we would like to avoid because the whole point with doing bagging is to build decision trees that are a little bit different, that are not exactly identical to each other, so that we can actually reduce the variance from the case of a single decision tree and actually get estimates of this prediction uncertainty. So how are we going to fix this problem? The way we fix this problem is actually very parallel to the way that we did bagging. Bagging was used to basically randomly sample the rows, and by rows I mean these end students. The way we did that was basically doing a different 80-20 split each time. Now we can imagine randomly sampling the columns, which means randomly sampling these P features. So what we're going to do is for each of these decision trees that we build, at each level, when we think about which feature is the next one that we're going to split on, we restrict the features that that decision tree is able to use at that point. So we don't allow it to use all P features. We randomly pick a subset of something smaller. Let's say P was equal to 100 we might only give it access to 10 features each time it's trying to split and decide which feature to split on. This allows the model to better generalize. What that means is that it's not always going to pick family income in every single tree. Now that we're restricting the features that it can split on at each point, different decision trees will have access to a different set of these features. And so we're going to introduce this variability, this very necessary variability into our decision trees. So that idea is called the random subspaces method. So at each split, we're only going to consider a subset of features. And how do we know how many features to consider? Well, these are some rules of thumb. These are parameters that you're allowed to change. These are just some rules of thumb. If you're doing a classification problem, people will typically pick the integer that's closest to square root of p. So that's why I said that if we have 100 features, we typically allow 10 randomly chosen features at each step of the decision tree. If you're doing a classification problem, then people typically will use the integer closest to p divided by 3. So if this was a classification problem, 
and we had p equals 100 features, we might use something like 33 features. But again, these numbers are up to you. They're something that you should actually vary and see how it changes the strength of your model. So now just to recap these two modifications together, the bagging idea and the random subspaces idea, are what makes decision trees different from random forests. And I want to make this really clear because here comes my opinions about random forests. In the machine learning community, I think there's a set of people who get a new data set and their first instinct is to just apply a random forest to it. And that's not necessarily what you want to do. The reason you don't want to do that is because if you don't know how a random forest works, then you have no idea what you're actually doing and you might run into trouble down the road. So I want everyone to fully understand how a random forest works and how it adds benefits on top of decision trees before you go ahead and just blindly apply it to whatever machine learning problem you might have. So in a nutshell, bagging allows us to introduce some variation on the rows, so these end students, and the random subspaces method allows us to introduce some variability in the columns or these P features. And by introducing variability in these two dimensions, that's where the random in random forest come from. By introducing variability in both dimensions, we allow the final model, the final random forest, to better generalize to students that it's never seen before, students outside of these end students in our sample. And now this video wouldn't be complete if I didn't talk about some of the cons of random forests. So it still has most of the same pros. We eliminate this tendency to overfit by considering many trees instead of just a single tree. But there are two big cons I can think of. The first is pretty obvious, it's computational complexity. So let's say that a single decision tree took you an hour to train. Well, now you have a thousand decision trees, so you do the math there, it's gonna take a lot longer to train. But the fact is that a single decision tree probably won't take you an hour with a strong enough computer, it's probably gonna be somewhat tractable. But I think the biggest con that people talk about, and this is opinion number two of mine on how random forests get talked about in the ML community, there's another group of people who just won't touch random forests at all. They think that they're not interpretable, Decision trees were nice and interpretable. Why do we have to go and ruin them? They won't even take a look at them. So I will agree that the other con of random forest is that it does kind of take this interpretability away a little bit. With a single decision tree, we can just print out the decision tree and show someone and it's pretty obvious. Now we have like a thousand decision trees and it's harder to show everyone a thousand decision trees at a time. But that doesn't mean that random forests have no interpretability. The last thing we'll talk about is feature importance. So we have these P features and we want to get some numerical measure about how important is each feature relative to the other features. And if we have this, we can say things like the GPA of the student was the most important predictor and maybe height was the least important predictor. But how do we assign numerical values to this? Well, it's a pretty simple four step process and you can of course vary this in certain ways, but here's the general flavor of the process. The first step is we compute the accuracy on the ith training set. So let me explain it in the pseudocode. We randomly sample 80-20 we train on 80% and then we compute the accuracy on that training set. So it's probably gonna be really high because that's the exact training set used to build the model. So it's probably gonna be pretty strong. The reason we do this is to compare it against the next thing that we do. The next thing we do is we permute the Jth feature. So let me make things concrete for a second. Let's say we're trying to determine the importance of GPA versus the importance of height. So let's look at GPA first. We're going to permute the GPA of all the students. Permute basically means that we're randomly gonna shuffle the GPA of all the students. This would be disastrous for the model if GPA was an important feature, right? Think about that. What I'm saying is that if GPA was a very important feature, a very important predictor in most of our decision trees, if I were to randomly jumble all the GPAs of students, then my accuracy should be dropping by a lot. And that's exactly what I do next. I compute the accuracy again, so I use the same decision trees, so T1, T2, all the way to TB, and I apply them on the modified training set. The modified training set being the same training set where I permuted all of the GPAs. Now, since GPA was an important feature in my model, my accuracy is gonna drop by a lot because it really needed that GPA to be there. So I'm gonna get the accuracy of the model on the unmodified training set, and I'm going to subtract the accuracy on the permuted training set. And I'm gonna do this for every single training set from one, two, three, all the way to B and take the average over all training sets. So what I'm expecting is that since GPA is a really important feature, this is gonna be a big drop in accuracy for all or most of my decision tree. So this difference is gonna be pretty big. Now let's say I'm trying to find the feature importance for height. I'm gonna do the same thing, get the accuracy on the ith training set. I'm going to permute all of the heights but because height was not an important factor to begin with, it probably won't matter that much. So now when I get the accuracy on these permuted training sets, it's not gonna change by a lot because I wasn't using that height for anything anyway, probably. So that change in accuracy 
averaged over all I training sets is probably going to be rather low. And this is the number that I use in order to judge the feature importance. The more important features are the ones where this accuracy changes by a lot, meaning that that feature was important for the model. The less important features are the ones where the accuracy changes by barely any, which means that the models weren't really using that feature for anything anyway, therefore it's not important. So this is a very easy way to judge the importance of the features, even using a model as complex as a random forest. So what I would say to people who think random forests are not interpretable, I think that there are ways to get the interpretability of random forests. Don't be scared of them. And for people who are just ready to apply a random forest to your data without even thinking about it, I would say really understand the theory. So the bagging and random subspaces idea behind random forests before you do that. So hopefully this video helped to understand random forests, why we use them and how they work. Any comments, please leave them below. If you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. And I'll see you next time.